I've often thought that parts of our identity become more prominent, a bigger part of our being, when they're under threat. For instance, I could perfectly well identify as someone who loves cheese. I do love cheese. And not just any cheese, but that sort of mild, creamy cheese, the sort that spreads across your tongue. The kind you can add just a little pinch of herbs or mushrooms or even fruit to, and it sings. But I don't really spend much energy on that part of myself because, quite frankly, no one is trying to take my cheese away. I can darn well go out to the store and pick up a triple cream brie and nobody's gonna stop me. Nobody is going to call me a filthy dairy slut or burn Havarti in my lawn for my cheese preferences. It's fine. On the other hand, I made an entire video about the fact that I'm fat. To me, the two statements, I love cheese and I am fat, are of roughly equal importance, but to society, the statement, I am fat, implies that I am lazy, that I am less of a person, and myself is under attack. And so being fat is important to my identity in a way that loving cheese never could be. I have never felt so Jewish in my life as I have in the last five years. Hello and welcome. I'm Zilla, and this is my Athenaeum. Today I'd like to talk about what it's like to be a Jew in the year 2021. In fact, I have too much to say for just one video, so I'll be making a short series on the topic. Today I'll provide a short introduction, define some terms, talk about why I want to address it now. In later videos I'll dig into bigger questions like, are Jews white? And how do American Jews feel about Israel and Palestine? Once I've come to the end of what I feel like is the whole series, I'll string them all together in sort of a supercut, an omnibus, if you will, so that you can share it all together if you like. So let's get started. First, I want to define some basic terms. Now, they may seem either a little bit obvious or possibly a little counterintuitive, depending on what I'm talking about, but I think it's important to establish sort of the range of meaning that these things can have if we're going to have a serious discussion. Okay, so Jew. A Jew can be anyone who practices Judaism of any type. But a Jew can also be someone of Jewish ancestry, depending on the context, or just somebody raised in the culture of Judaism, since what Judaism is seems to entangle both religion and culture and heritage. There's a lot going on, and like black, it can be hard to define in just one way. I'll try to be clear about how I'm using that term when it comes up. The term for specifically non-Jewish is Gentile. That's the English term. You might also hear goy, goish, goyim, things like that. I'll try to stay away from that, just stick to the English. There are also other terms that are less neutral towards Gentiles, and you won't be hearing those here. Now we come to a couple of terms that I personally find really tricky. Uh, let's start with anti-Semitism. Now the basic meaning of anti-Semitism is prejudice, hatred, or aggression towards Jews or Judaism. And that's kind of a wide spectrum. And it gets even stranger when you realize that Semite doesn't just mean Jew. But that is the preferred English term, and so while I might 
get into something and say it's anti-Judaic, I'll try to keep to the common usage. Likewise, Islamophobia is frankly an imperfect term. Not only does it mean in English the prejudice, hatred, and aggression towards Islam, but Muslim people and Arabs, which are not the same thing, although they do overlap. Even more than that, the root phobia, which in Greek means fear, opens the door to a bunch of semantic word games where people will say, oh, I'm not afraid of Muslims. But that's not what it means. In English, this word is used to talk about hatred and bigotry. And so that's what I'm using it for. Yeah. Where possible, I'll disambiguate by using anti-Arab or anti-Palestinian or whatever applies. Finally, I think we need to talk about Zionism. The problem with Zionism is that there are two very distinct definitions. The one that I grew up hearing, and the one I think that most people who self-identify as Zionists would accept, is the recognition of a need for a Jewish homeland in light of the history of persecution and genocide against the Jewish people. Combine this with a desire to be near the sacred sites of Judaism in Jerusalem and the surrounding lands, and you have what I grew up with as Zionism. The other definition, the one I hear more commonly used in media, especially surrounding trouble in the Middle East between Israel and Palestine, is a sort of feeling of divine right that Israel and the Jewish people have ownership based on God's decree of Jerusalem and the surrounding lands, regardless of who is in them right now. I'm not going to say that there aren't Jews who feel this way. There certainly are, both in Israel and out in the diaspora. But I don't think that that's the definition that most Zionists would agree with. So when I talk about Zionism, if I even use that word, I'll try to be very clear about which definition I'm using. But I think it's really important for this discussion that you know that both those definitions exist that they're different, and that they often get conflated, especially from outside. Got that? Okay, great. Let's move on to why I want to talk about this and why now. I grew up in a Reformed Jewish family in a major city in the U.S. Religion was certainly a part of our lives, but it wasn't exactly a defining influence. As a child and young adult, I rarely encountered hatred of Judaism, or even ignorance about it, and I kind of grew up thinking that anti-Semitism was a thing of the past. After all, we won the war, right? America killed the Nazis and freed the Jews, and now the only people who think Jews are bad are fringe conspiracy theorists, right? Judaism was a big part of my life as a child, but as I grew older and started to question things, I felt a disconnect. There were just too many arbitrary rules and too many things we had to take on faith. It wasn't comfortable for me. Now, don't get me wrong, I still have a deep fondness for Judaism as a whole. I love that the culture I was raised in values scholarship, friendly debate, silly overthinking, change and progress. I love that there is a holiday where you're supposed to get drunk, if you can. And another where you're supposed to really sit and think about the past and atone for any mistakes that you've made. Promise to do better in the new year. But I'm too much the scholar and critical thinker and not enough the believer to be able to take God for granted. I started to argue with my rabbis and debate my religious school teachers. There was really no help for it. I was either going to have to become a rabbi or leave the faith. I decided to walk away. I've felt so much better since because I don't have to obey rules that are just arbitrary. I don't have to pretend a faith that I don't feel. And I don't have to pay lip service to prayers that I know other people find meaningful and sacred. It almost felt like blasphemy. But 
I still eat Jewish food, and I do keep Yom Kippur. That was nearly 20 years ago. I'm not a religious or practicing Jew, and I haven't been. When I say I've felt more Jewish in the last five years than I have in the rest of my life, that's not me wandering back towards a faith I never had. That's me coming to the understanding that my culturally Jewish identity could get me or my family killed. And that's why I want to talk about it now. In 2015, Donald Trump became the Republican nominee for President of the United States. Concurrently, the Anti-Defamation League, an organization whose purpose is to track anti-Semitic activity across America, noted a large spike in such activity. That spike continued to rise in 2016 and 2017, and in 2018, America faced its largest and most deadly mass shooting of Jews, 11 people killed at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. The next year, there were three mass shootings, one at a place of worship, one at a Jewish grocer, and one at a rabbi's home. Despite many claims to the contrary, this is no coincidence, and just because it's only one of several kinds of bigotry that Trumpism encouraged doesn't erase the fact that it happened. Still, people like to point to the Jews in his retinue, like Jared Kushner, Stephen Miller, and even conservative sophist talking head Ben Shapiro as evidence that Trumpism can't possibly harbor anti-Jewish sentiment. But just like the argument that you have a black friend doesn't make you not a racist, this argument just doesn't really hold water. Bigots like Trump do not care what tools they use to achieve their ends, and you can bet that as soon as they've finished serving their purpose, any of those people would be lumped in with the rest of the undesirables in a blink of the eye. The other big argument that people like to make, that the American right wing can't possibly be anti-Semitic, is their purported support of Israel. And I can't entirely blame even the Jewish people who fall for this rhetoric in the face of so many factions who want us dead in the very recent, like within living memory, actual genocide attempt on all of us. Quite frankly, it's understandable if people cling to the semblance of support instead of its substance. The American right wing does not care about Jews. Aside from generalized Islamophobia, there are two main reasons why they support Israel. The first is war profiteering. They want a good market for their weapons, which the US is supplying in great quantities. And they want to loot that cheap, lovely crude oil that they can make all that money off of. Artifacts to the Museum of the Bible and other things imported from places too war-torn to really look after it. The religious right are even more terrifying. They want war in the Middle East to bring about the apocalypse. Like literal Jesus rising and choosing them to go alongside him to heaven, leaving the unbelievers in sin. I wish I were exaggerating, but I am not. I cannot stress enough that the American right wing does not care about Jews. They are, one and all, using Israel. And it's not to Israel's benefit. Moreover, supporting Israel does not mean supporting American Jews. Anti-Semitic laws and policies are put into place with alarming regularity, and even Trump himself admitted in his supposed statement of support that he doesn't think Jews are or can be American. Unfortunately, the American left is not much better at being allies to their Jewish brethren. It's that conflation of Israel with Jews 
it's not uncommon for somebody on the left to start in a really good place, calling for humanitarian aid and intervention in Palestine, and slip right over into anti-Semitic rhetoric. Jews across the diaspora are frequently called to account for a government they don't belong to, and quite often have little love for. It's frankly terrifying to be a Jew on the left, not knowing if your friends and comrades will even recognize the setup for an anti-Semitic purge. This is especially complicated because of Jews like Shapiro, Miller, and Kushner. There are plenty of Jews who refuse to recognize that just because we have been discriminated against and killed, doesn't make us immune from the same human impulses that caused it to happen to us. Jews are, just like any other people, susceptible to fascism, to genocidal thought, to terror. Killing and displacing Palestinians is not any less abhorrent than the killing and displacing of Jews. So it's understandable, if terrifying, that the American left frequently conflates Israeli politics and Jewish identity, especially given American traditions of anti-Semitism in their white supremacy. One of the central pillars of American white supremacy rests on this idea that there's a global conspiracy of wealthy Jews manipulating black people to take over from white people in a kind of white genocide. Jews will not replace us! Jews will not replace us! And that gets really prickly when it gets wrapped up in black liberation movements. Jews become this kind of hyper-white, both white and not, despite the prevalent existence of Jews of color. And then there's that stereotype of very wealthy, very influential Jews running things from behind the scenes that... I'm gonna have to do a whole segment on that, aren't I? But seriously, one of the biggest religious movements of Black Liberation, the Nation of Islam, was founded by Louis Farrakhan, a man who is virulently and outspokenly anti-Semitic. That attitude infects his organization and trickles down into their policies and thus out into communities of color, because the Nation of Islam really does do a lot of good in the world. It's been amazing for communities of color across America. And who could blame anyone for seeing that tangible good and not noticing the indirect harm? Meanwhile, fringe groups, like some sects of the Black Hebrew Israelites, firmly believe that any non-Black Jew is an interloper who must be destroyed. And globalist conspiracy theories underpin even seemingly harmless things, like Jay-Z writing a lyric about how wealthy Jews are, or Trevor Noah making a joke about how every media star has a Jew behind him. It's everywhere. And then in 2015, my home country elected as president a man who sleeps with Mein Kampf by his bedside. It wasn't so long ago that my own grandparents and great-grandparents fled from Europe to escape the concentration camps and pogroms. They were lucky. Unlike so many others, they weren't turned back at the border. When I saw what was happening in 2015, when Trump won the nomination, I seriously considered fleeing the country. I considered my choices at that point to be run to safety or stand and fight. I chose fight. And I don't think we're out of the woods yet. I'm going to keep using my best weapon, my voice, to push back against the anti-Semitism I still see. Keep learning, friends. Hey, thanks so much for sticking around to the end of the video. 
As always, like, comment, share, subscribe, all of those little things that help the YouTube algorithm know I exist. I do have a Patreon and a coffee account linked in the description if you're so inclined. By the way, I am actively looking for a Black American sensitivity reader, especially if you happen to be Jewish. There will, of course, be compensation and credit given. So if you're interested in that, you can uh, message me on Twitter. An organization which track tracks. What am I in Michigander? That's Michigis.